What's up everybody and welcome back to another PT Pioneer video. My name is Nick and in today's video we're going to be discussing the 10 hardest CSCS questions. After today's video you'll be confident in your ability to answer difficult questions, you'll understand the process of elimination of wrong answers, and you can confidently go into your CSCS exam knowing you're fully prepared. We hope you've been enjoying more of these educational videos, and if you have, definitely smash that like button so we can continue to make them. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that little notification bell so you don't miss any of our videos coming out in the near future. Make sure to get your free copy of the CSCS exam cheat sheet. Link is in the description. The CSCS exam is one of the hardest tests in the fitness industry. However, even with such a difficult test overall, some of the questions are more difficult than others. In this video, we're going to break down the 10 hardest CSCS exam questions so that you can be fully prepared for all the challenges that you'll face in your exam. One of the hardest questions to answer is how to program design based on normative data. Here, we need to consider the following example. A 21-year-old 5'10 male collegiate Division I soccer player weighing 165 pounds has the following assessment results. Body fat percentage of 11%, a pro agility time of 8.5 seconds, a back squat of 305 pounds, a 40 meter sprint in 5.5 seconds, and a vertical jump of 24 inches. Which of the following exercises would be most important for block three of development? We have a modified 505 drill with a 1 to 4 work to rest ratio, a T test with a 1 to 4 work to rest ratio, and a Y drill. B, decelerations, two sets of four with a 1 to 4 work to rest ratio, and lateral shuffling, one set of four at 10 meters. C, back squat, three sets of five at 80% of their 10 rep max. Or D, one set of two 20 meter block starts, one set of three 30 meter accelerations from crouch. Here we must compare the athlete's weakest score compared to the normative data of the sport. For his body fat percentage, 11% places this athlete at the very lean, which is normal for soccer players. Looking at his pro agility score and comparing it to the normative data found in the textbook for a Division II college men's soccer player, the standard is 4.8 seconds plus or minus 0.33 seconds from his pro agility test. For the one rep max back squat for our athlete, the ranges provided in the textbook for soccer players are 297.6 plus or minus 35.7, 362.9 plus or minus 43.9, and 378.5 plus or minus 46.7. As such, a back squat of 305 pounds puts this athlete on the lower end of the normative data. Now looking at his vertical jump, we can see that his 24 inch jump is in line with some of the normative data inside of the textbook. And looking at our athlete's vertical jump, you can see that it is in line with the normative data, which pegs vertical height at 24.3 plus or minus 2.8 inches for Division I men's soccer players. The 40 meter sprint time for Division I men's soccer players is 4.90 plus or minus 0.2, placing our athletes slightly lower than the average. With all this data in mind, we can now see that the most important aspect for this athlete is his agility. If we take a look back at our answer options, we can deduce that A and B are both agility options, while C is max strength and D is speed. Knowing this information, we can now narrow our choices down to A or B. Looking at the difference between the two, you can see that the modified 505 drill, the T-test and Y drill are all more advanced than decelerations or lateral shuffling and therefore should be placed in block three development. The decelerations and shuffling would be more appropriate for block one, however, the question was specifically asking for block three. Notice that a single question can contain elements of athletic testing, data assessment, program design, periodization, and needs analysis all affecting a single correct or incorrect answer. Knowing this, any of the provided data could sway the answer either way, so make sure to read the question in full. The second hardest question on the CSCS exam is the sprint muscle action. One of the hardest things to memorize is the overall form of sprinting and the muscle actions that occur in each phase of the sprint. There are multiple phases of maximal velocity sprinting, as well as different form requirements for the initial phase of acceleration. For each phase, you need to know the relevant eccentric and concentric muscle actions, as well as their specific role in sprinting. 
Let's consider the following example. Which of the following actions propels the center of gravity forward during the late support phase of maximal velocity sprinting? A. Eccentric hip flexion B. Concentric hip flexion C. Eccentric knee flexion or D. Concentric knee extension One clue that can help lies in the wording of the question itself. Which action propels the center of gravity forward? Given that propulsion involves an accelerative force, you can eliminate the eccentric answers from your question already. Eccentric actions almost always correlate with a braking or decelerating force. If you visualize these two muscle actions, you can probably deduce that hip flexion, which involves lifting the knee upwards, would not result in a propulsive force on its own. At this point, you can safely select answer D, concentric knee extension. If you memorized every single bullet point in a sprint action, you would probably know this. While this is technically a recall question, knowing the difference between concentric and eccentric actions and understanding the dynamics of movement at each joint can help you deduce the answer without memorizing the entire sprint form. Hardest question number three, sprint form assessment corrections. The next question also revolves around sprint technique, specifically correcting techniques when athletes display errors. Let's consider another example. During sprint acceleration, an athlete steps over the knee of the stance leg. Which of the following corrections is appropriate? A. Instruct the athlete to space feet 1.5 to 2 feet lengths. B. Instruct the athlete to push or drive through the ground to initiate the sprint. C. Instruct the athlete to initiate movement by driving through the ground and keep the swing leg foot close to the ground. Or D. The athlete's sprint form is correct. This recall question asks you to memorize the sprint form table and corrections. Now, instead of memorizing each and every table in the CSCS textbook, being able to visualize sprinting form will aid you more in this question than memorizing would. If we take a look at the common sprinting technique errors, we know that the accelerative sprinting requires a nearly horizontal shin angle on the swing leg, not stepping over the planted leg, which will lead us to answer C, which happens to be the correct answer. Hardest question number four, a one rep max estimation. We can guarantee that during your CSCS exam you will stumble upon a question that asks you to estimate a one repetition max off of a set of reps that an athlete performs. So knowing that, let us consider another example. An athlete has a five rep max back squat of 300 pounds. Based on this data, what is the athlete's predicted one rep max rounded to the nearest pound? A, 345 pounds, B, 316 pounds, C, 400 pounds, or D, 375 pounds. In this example, you must know that a five rep max is estimated to be 87% of an athlete's one rep max. Therefore, dividing the five rep max by 0.87 gives you an estimated one rep max of 344.83 pounds, which rounded to the nearest pound is 345 pounds, giving us the answer of A. Of course, in practice, the predicted one rep max does not always add up. However, you need to be familiar with these numbers as this is not something that will be provided to you on exam day. So become very familiar with this estimated one rep max table as it is virtually guaranteed that you will get one of these questions in your exam. Hardest question number five, appropriate test selection for specific sports. Although you may not have played every sport in the world, some questions will ask you for specific tests on specific sports. Let us consider an example. Which of the following tests is most appropriate for measuring aerobic capacity in lacrosse athletes? A, a 1.5 mile run. B, Margaria Kalaman. C, maximal aerobic speed. Or D, yo-yo intermittent recovery. In this question, we can immediately eliminate option B, Margaria Kalaman, as that is a power exercise and not an aerobic test. From here, we need to think about the aerobic demands of lacrosse. Athletes are tasked with running up and down the field with little to no recovery in between. As such, option A can be ruled out as lacrosse players are not running a mile and a half continuously, so this is an unneeded test for this sport. The maximal aerobic speed test is also unnecessary as it involves continuous running at increasingly faster paces with no rests in between. The yo-yo intermittent test involves two 20 meter sprints with a 10 second rest in between. 
So therefore, between these options, the yo-yo intermittent recovery best represents the aerobic demands of field sports such as lacrosse and would be most appropriate test type for these athletes. To answer this question, you did not need to necessarily be familiar with the sport, but you did need to be familiar with the various tests presented to you. We did, however, need to deduce the different demands of the sport, so having a familiarization with most sports will definitely be helpful on this exam. From here, we should be able to match the most appropriate tests for the given sport based on its needs. What's up everybody? We really hope you're enjoying this video today, so we wanted to ask you one more time if you could please smash that like button, as well as subscribe and hit that notification bell. This will allow you to see when any of our videos come out and keep you up to date with what's coming in the future. Hardest test question number six, estimating nutritional requirements. Although not a large section on the test, the CSCS exam will ask you various nutritional questions. The CSCS exam wants to test your nutritional knowledge regarding different athletes, and this will require you to memorize various macronutrient guidelines for specific sports. Let's take an example of an Olympic weightlifter. A 100 kilogram Olympic weightlifter requires how many grams of protein per day? A, 100 to 120 grams, B, 100 to 160 grams, C, 150 to 200 grams, or D, 200 to 250 grams. In this example, you must know that Olympic weightlifters require 1.5 to 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, which means that this athlete requires 150 to 200 grams of protein per day, or option C. You could be asked about any macronutrient need or any sport listed in the CSCS curriculum, so make sure that you study up on the macronutrient guidelines as well as the various sport demands. Hardest question number seven, types of test validity. Athletic testing validity and reliability will definitely be on this test. You must know every type of validity and reliability metric and their specific definitions. Let's take another example. What term is used to describe test results remaining consistent despite having a different tester? A. Inner rater reliability. B. Intrasubject reliability. C. Construct validity. Or D. External validity. In this case, the answer is A. Inner rater reliability. There is no real way around having to memorize the different validity and reliability terms. Although some of these terms can give you clues, many of them sound familiar but refer to distinct characteristics. These terms are something that you'll really need to dial in your memorization techniques on and be fully prepared on your CSCS exam. Hardest question number eight, carvonate and percentage of maximal heart rate calculations. You will be asked to assign an athlete the proper exercise intensity in terms of a heart rate range based on either the carvonate method or the percentage of maximal heart rate method. Consider the following example. A 25-year-old athlete with a resting heart rate of 70 beats per minute is assigned an intensity of 60 to 70% of functional capacity. Using the Carvonin method, what is the required heart rate range to be at this intensity? A, 145 to 158 beats per minute. B, 155 to 170 beats per minute. C, 125 to 145 beats per minute. Or D, 117 to 137 beats per minute. Let's recall that the Carvonin method is heart rate reserve times exercise intensity plus resting heart rate equals your target heart rate. As such, you need to calculate the heart rate reserve. The heart rate reserve is age predicted maximal heart rate minus resting heart rate. In the example, our age predicted maximal heart rate is 220 minus our athlete's age, which is 25, giving us 195 beats per minute. Finally, we need to calculate the lower end of the range and the higher end of the range using the lower and higher intensities. In this case, 60% and 70% respectively. Our low target heart rate is 195 minus 70 times 0.6 plus 70. This gives us 145. And our high target heart rate is 195 minus 70 times 0.7 plus 70 equals 157.5 and rounding that up to the nearest beat per minute is 158. With this calculation complete, we can see that answer A is the correct answer and that the athlete's target heart rate should be between 145 and 158 beats per minute. Note that answer D would be correct if we use the percentage of the maximal heart rate method, which multiplies the respective intensity by the age predicted maximal heart rate. 
So if you end up confusing the two formulas, you may end up with the incorrect answer. So it is vital that you understand which equation is which. Hardest question number nine, equipment spacing requirements. Now, not all of us will be putting together a gym once we pass our CSCS exam. However, the NSCA has tasked us with understanding the spacing requirements needed for gyms. And as such, we must know the specific requirements for such facility. So let's get into another example. How many Olympic lifting platforms would fit into a 600 square foot space? A, two, B, three, C, four, or D, five? In this case, you would need to know that a typical lifting platform requires 144 square feet of space. As such, you could fit a total of four platforms in a 600 square foot space, given that the additional 24 square feet would not be enough room for an additional platform. Note that this question could ask about any piece of aerobic equipment, so be sure to understand the chart and memorize some numbers if needed. Hardest question number 10, Olympic lifting technique. The CSCS exam will require you to know and understand all of the Olympic lifts inside of their textbook. This includes the initial setup as well as the bar position in each portion of the lift. Let's consider our 10th and final example. During the second pull of the power snatch, when should the athlete rapidly shrug the shoulders? A, when the bar rises just above the knees. B, once the body is under the bar. C, once the lower body joints reach full extension. Or D, after gaining control and balance. For this question, you need to memorize each phase of the power snatch as taught by the NSCA. The correct answer in this case is C. Once the lower body joint reaches full extension, the athlete rapidly shrugs the shoulders with the elbows fully extended and still out to the sides. Note that any Olympic lifts could be presented to you on the exam, including the log clean and press, power cleans, and tire flips. Be sure you're familiar with each Olympic lift as well as every phase within that lift. As you can see, the CSCS exam requires you to have a wide range of knowledge spanning the entire curriculum. Knowing the information in depth and going through the process of elimination, followed by visualization, can help you solve some of the questions even if you do not memorize the textbook word for word. In other cases, you must memorize some numbers that will allow you to make the necessary calculations. Understand that these are just example questions and not the exact questions that you'll come up on your test. These just show the depth of the questions that the NSCA will ask you in order for you to pass the CSCS exam. Nevertheless, if you understand the process we have done above, you are fully prepared for whatever questions the exam asks you.